Okay, well, welcome um, back. Um, I'm coming to you from Boston, Massachusetts today. Again, uh, we're doing a remote lecture because I need to be away. So I hope you'll find this useful. I've done this for other classes and have generally gotten pretty good feedback. Um, so let's see, a few housekeeping issues. Reminder that your uh, next literature review is due Thursday. You can email that to Junchen. Um, and then I'll see you the following uh, uh, Thursday, Thursday the, the 23rd of February. Uh, today we're going to continue the discussion of statistics that we started in class last week. And um, we're going to show some more examples, talk about a few more applications. So um, after class on uh, Thursday of last week, I got a couple questions about the degrees of freedom, which I feel like um, I kind of did some hand-waving explanation. So I want to give a better explanation of what we really mean by the degrees of freedom. Um, similarly with standard air, I just kind of plopped down the equation for standard air, but I didn't give a very um, detailed explanation. So I just kind of want to describe it in a little bit more detail what we mean by the standard air. I also want to talk about confidence intervals because I think that is um, another important uh, statistical tool that you'll use that we didn't talk, to, talk about. And then another example um, of, of t-testing and p-values and um, that's kind of fun. And then I'm gonna also going to show you how to do this with Excel because that's how you're actually going to do it. For, for uh, um, an exam, you would be expected to do this both with, um, with actual pen and paper as, and a t-table as well as with Excel. I also want to talk about a paired t-test. We didn't talk about those. And then close with a Bland-Altman analysis. Bland-Altman analysis is going to be particularly important for those of you in Darren Lapome's lab, Sheng Shu's lab, Joe Wang's lab, these, these examples where you're making this new device to measure blood pressure, for example, and you want to go and compare that to the gold standard approach to measuring blood pressure. Okay, so degrees of freedom. So last time I just kind of told you that it's the number of observations minus one equals the degrees of freedom. And so that wasn't very satisfying to some of you, and I understand it wasn't very satisfying to me either. So I looked up the definition. Each of a number of independently variable factors affecting the range of states in which a system may exist in particular, okay? Um, we could probably do without this. But the key, the key words here are independently and variable that affect a system. Okay, so let's look at our favorite example from statistics, the coin toss, okay? So what are the degrees of freedom in a coin toss? It can either be heads or tails, right? So if you flip a coin and you get a head, you don't, I don't need to ask you did you also get a tail, right? You know by definition that if you got a head, that you did not get a tail, right? So the degree of freedom in this situation is one, okay? The number of independently variable factors affecting the range of states in which a system may exist, okay? For a coin toss, there's only one independently variable factor, right? It's is it a head or not? Or you could just similarly say, is it a tail or not? Okay. Um, you could kind of expand this and what if, what if we flipped, um, what if you did seven flips, right? H, T, H, H, T, 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 okay? What's the degrees of freedom there? It's still one. It's still one because if, if I ask you, um, how many tails did you get? You could say, well, I got three heads. And then by definition, we know that there's four tails, right? There's what are the independently variable factors affecting the range of states 
in which the system, there's still only one factor, head or tails, right? Okay, so if we did 100 coin flips, it would still be one degree of freedom. So what about this old game? Where you put the ball, there's like a ball, and there's a red cup, a yellow cup, and a blue cup, right? What's the degree of freedom there? Two, yes, thank you. Thank you, Fong Chen. We have a guest TA today. Fong Chen is stepping in for Jun Chen Wong. Um, so thank you, Fong. Um, so there is two degrees of freedom, right? Because if I say, is it in the red cup? And you would say, no. And then I say, is it in the yellow cup? And you would say, no then I know by definition that it's in the blue cup, right? So there's only two, even though there are three variables here, right? Red, yellow, and blue. What are the number of independently variable factors affecting the range of states in which this can exist? I can get the answer with only two variables, right? I can get the answer with only two variables here. Okay, so now let's start to talk a little bit more about um, what we do in statistics. So what if these are sizes of nanoparticles? Right, and we've got this range of sizes of nanoparticles, and I want to calculate the average of that population. Okay, so I would sum up, I can never make a sigma, and divide by n, right? Now the reason that the, the degrees of freedom here are n is because if I change any one of these, I'm going to change the outcome, right? If I made, if I made this one bigger, I would change the mean, right? If I made this one smaller, I would change the mean. If I made any change to any one of these nanoparticles, I would change the mean, and that's why we divide by n, the total number of the, uh, the number of observations when we're calculating the mean of a population. Okay, what about when we calculate the standard deviation? Okay. Different situation. Here, our degrees of freedom are n minus 1. And it's not entirely intuitive why that is. But the reason is, is that we have one fewer variable affecting our outcome. So um, let's just do a simple example. What if I told you the, the x bar equals 10, and n's are 7 and 10, and I wanted you to tell me what this last number was. It would be 13, right? You don't need me to tell you that this is 13, because I'm giving you the average. Similarly, to calculate the standard deviation, you have to know the mean, right? And so the fact that you have this mean and you're comparing this mean to each and every x sub n, x1, x2, x3, x4, you're comparing it to the mean, that means that's why you lose this last um, degree of freedom. That's why you lose one degree of freedom because you don't need the nth number here. You lose one degree of freedom by including this variable, right? Because you include this piece of data up here, you no longer have this variable at the, at the bottom down here, okay? So that's why in a standard deviation, it's n minus 1 for your degrees of freedom, okay? Um, I did this just to prove this to myself, so I didn't really believe it. Um, this is kind of small, hold on. 
So here I took just random, I just made up these numbers in Excel. So x, 1, 2, 3, blah, 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 down to n. Then I calculated the average of these. And then here I subtracted the average from the individual. Okay, so 4 minus 4.9 is negative 0.09. And then I just repeated that all the way down there. And I had forgotten this rule or this just truth that if you sum up these differences, they're always going to equal zero, right? The difference between the individuals and the mean is always going to equal zero. So that's another kind of way of thinking about why the x1, x2, x3, but x sub n, you will know because you know that it has to equal zero when you sum up the difference versus the, the mean of that population, okay? So this is just saying the same thing I said on the previous slide. It just kind of had an example and talked about this, uh, the nature of these. Okay, so that's why degrees of freedom in that situation is equal to n minus one. Now, what about when we talked about um, a pooled standard deviation? What about when we had a test statistic, when we were trying to calculate t? And let's see if I can do this from memory. n1 minus 1, s1 squared plus n2 minus 1, s2 squared over n1 plus n2 minus 2. OK. That was for our pooled standard deviation when we had, for example, synthesis method number one, synthesis number two, and we had these kinds of particles and we wanted to compare them. So we had x bar one and x bar two, right? So we needed to know, and similarly we had S1 and S2, and we wanted to know what the pooled standard deviation was. So, of course, we lose one degree of freedom for calculating the, uh, the mean and the standard deviation of 1 and 2, and that's why we're subtracting 2 from the denominator of the pooled standard deviation, because we've lost 2 degrees of freedom. Okay. So hopefully that explains uh, what, what degrees of freedom mean and why they um, affected our different test statistics as we calculated previously. Okay? Um, okay, next topic. I just wanted to briefly talk about the standard error. And so I told you last time that the standard error is the standard deviation divided by the square root of the number of observations, right? And I said it's a good trick whenever you have data that have big error bars, right, that you can say, say in the caption, hey, instead of plotting the standard deviation, I'm actually plotting the standard error because that gives you tighter air bars and it makes it easier to publish your paper, right? <laughs> okay, so that's all well and good, but why? What is the nature of this? What, what does this really mean? So it essentially is describing how well does the standard deviation of our population approximate the true population variance, right? So remember, if we have x bar plus or minus s for our, for our um, sample, that if we looked at the entire population, it's this mu plus or minus, plus or minus sigma. This is for every single observation that we could approximately make, okay? So when we try to compare the sample to the population, there's going to be differences in the, both, both the, the, the mean that we measure 
and the variation, okay? So how can we start to understand this a little bit, a little bit better? What we could, what you can do is start to do different trials. So maybe you measure one sample, pop, a sample from a population, and that gives you X bar plus S for trial one. Then you do another trial. And you get another a mean and a standard deviation. And you do another trial. Okay, so on and so on. You can just keep doing multiple, multiple trials until you get for n number of trials, right? Now, this is, you don't have time for this, right? This is kind of just a thought experiment. But if you did this and you started to get a lot of different means, then you could make a histogram of those means. Right? So this is the histogram of all of your, all of the trials that you've done. Okay? And as this gets bigger and bigger, as you do more and more and more trials, of course that's going to more closely approximate the true population. That makes sense. Okay? So, what the standard error essentially is, is it's the variance if you could do increasingly large numbers of trials, okay? So you could take many random samples and each will have a sample mean and a standard deviation. You create a distribution of those sample means and the mean of that distribution approaches the population mean. So the standard deviation of this is the standard error, okay? But since we can't do that, we divide this sad little single population, our, our sad little n of seven or whatever we did, by the square root of the number of observations to try to say how well that will approximate the true population. Because, in case she just isn't projecting, the green is n equals 15, the, N, the red is n equals 135, and the blue is n equal to 500. So as we do more and more and more trials, we're tightening up how, we're tightening up our variance, right? We're tightening up our precision. So what we can do is use the standard error to estimate how well our sad little n of 15 would actually project out to an n of infinity or an n of the entire population. It's making this number smaller because it should be smaller, right? If we were dividing, if we were, if we we're trying to see how well does s approach the, the, the standard deviation of the entire population, it should be smaller and smaller and smaller, okay? So if we do an increasingly large number of trials, this number gets smaller and smaller. Okay, because your population is always going to have a wider spread than the uh, true population. Okay, so hopefully that makes that a little bit more clear. Why, why you can do this seemingly strange trick to your data. Okay. New topic. We talked about this. This was our, this was our old friend, the T-statistic. But just be aware that we can rearrange this uh, do, 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 do. right? We can rearrange this to write mu equals x bar plus or minus the t statistic times our standard deviation over the square root of number of observations. So this is what we can use to determine our confidence interval, okay? So this is not looking at necessarily, you know, a p-value in terms of saying is there a difference or not. It's saying what is the range 
of values that the true value is likely to hit um, at a given uh, confidence interval. Yes, question. Um, because, because of, why is it plus it should only be minus? Because inherently you're looking at this range. So this, let me get through an example, it'll, it'll make sense. Okay, you're saying if you actually solve this that because of this, well the reason is because the real formula is the absolute value. Yeah, okay, good point. So this is, a, this is the absolute value and so that's why this is a plus or minus, mathematically at least that's the reason. Okay. See, I'm not just talking to myself. <laughs> okay. Um, so what if I said, so you, you did maybe some layer by layer assembly of polystyrene sulfonate and polyalanine, and you put this on your novel substrate, and you found the values below. I have a feeling this is not projecting very well, so I'm gonna make this bigger. Is that coming across okay? Yeah. Okay. So you got these, these values, so an N of five, and I went ahead and calculated the mean and the standard deviation. So your supervisor then says, what is the 90% confidence interval of this? Okay, so we know the mean, we know the standard deviation, so we need the T value, we need the T statistic. So we can go to our table. So for an N equals five, we have four degrees of freedom. Now, one-tailed or two-tailed? Right? It's, it's a two-tailed situation because we're looking at plus or minus, right? We're looking at the range at which it is. So 90% confidence, two-tailed, we're looking at this column, okay? So our T statistic, our Z value is 2.132, okay? So then we're just kind of plugging and chugging. Um, so then our true value is equal to 12.5 nanometers plus or minus 2.132 times our standard deviation of 0 0.4 nanometers over the square root of the number of observations. And so this is 12.5 plus or minus 0 0.38 nanometers. Okay? So what if it was, tell me what it is. So this might not be very satisfying because this is basically the same number as the standard deviation. So we're like, well, what, what difference is this telling me? Right? Because you would write this as 12.5 plus or minus 0 0.4 nanometers, right? And this is basically the same number. But what, you, what the value is, is when you go back and look at a different confidence interval. So say you wanted to say this with 99% confidence. So 99% confidence, we've got to come here. So now our T statistic is 4.604, okay? So to redo that calculation at 99% confidence, so what do you think? Is it going to be a, a smaller or bigger range? Bigger, no, it's going to be a bigger range, right? So now it's 12.5 plus or minus 0 0.8 nanometers, okay? And if we wanted to say at 50% confidence, 12.5 plus or minus 0 0.1 nanometers. And I said earlier that at 95% confidence, it's 12.5 plus or minus 0 
nanometers. Okay, so hopefully this makes sense. If it doesn't, sit and think about it, that you have to have a bigger range in order for the true value. Remember, this is what we're saying. How sure are we that the true value falls within this range? To, have, to be really, really, really confident that the true value is going to hit into that bin, we have to have a wider range. Whereas if we only want to say, eh, a 50-50 chance that the true value is in this range, we can be much more narrow. Okay? So this is another way that um, you can report your data if you want to be slightly more sophisticated. Okay. Um, So let's talk about Excel by using a fun example. So you guys all know Lord Rayleigh, right? It turns out his real name is John William Strutt. And so there's, he's, he was like the third or fourth Baron Rayleigh. And um, so I, there's actually the current Baron Rayleigh. And um, he still has the same family name. I couldn't find a picture of him, though. I guess he's a very reclusive Baron. Um, but it's interesting to think that, that his heirs are still being peers in the peerage system in the United Kingdom. You know, we, we all know him from Rayleigh scattering. I know him from my own research in terms of rails. Rails is a unit of acoustic impedance when sound hits a material. How much um, reflectivity, how well does it impede that sound wave? So rail is a unit there. Um, but he also won the Nobel Prize for discovering argon. So this is when people sat around and got to do really interesting experiments that no one had ever done before. So people knew at that time that air was 20% oxygen and 80% nitrogen. So Rayleigh, for whatever reason, wanted to do some experiments. So he took nitrogen from the air. He made two different samples, nitrogen from the air and nitrogen from reactions. Oops, I said nitrous oxide here. I think what he did actually was did ammonium plus nitrite, and that would give you nitrogen plus water. So he could make synthetically pure nitrogen gas. Okay, this was before you could just dial up Prax air and, and have a tank of nitrogen. So he could make synthetically pure nitrogen gas. And then from normal air, he purged the oxygen using hot copper to make copper oxide. So he could quench out all of the oxygen from the air, and this would give him N2 as well. Okay, so he had two sources of N2. Okay. And this is his data. This is his real data, isn't that neat? It's particularly neat because he was recording grams with six significant digits. So this is like point, I mean, it's amazing that at the, the turn of the last century, they could still measure with that precision. Um, I mean, granted he had a lot of money and could afford a really nice balance, but. Um, so this was, this is his data, the values from air, where he just quenched out the oxygen, and then this is his synthetically pure um, his synthetically pure nitrogen that he synthesized, okay? So the weights of these gases, I don't know what the volume was, um, but they had the same volume, and then he weighed these gases, okay? And calculated the average and the standard deviation. So here is it plotted graphically, the weight of this gas. So from air, he's got a really tight distribution from the reaction, he had a broader distribution. That kind of makes sense, right? You're always going to, if you're just removing something as opposed to making something, you're going to have more variance when you're making something. So he's got um, a, a broader distribution here than from the air. But there's quite a big difference between these two. Well, relatively, right? If we plotted this in terms of milligrams, it would be even more pronounced. Okay, so, you know, he could say this is just, eh, I wasn't, there was, there was some, there's some kind of systematic error. But what he did is started to look at this using statistics a little more carefully. So let's do this. If I was to, if I was to tell you, this is a great like kind of homework question, what is the, what's the p-value here? 
So the first thing you would want to do is again calculate your pooled standard deviation. Okay, um, so you know the average of one, you know the average of method, well these are not, these are, don't really, I guess these are kind of methods, the x bar one, x bar two, s one and s two. So, Okay, so if you put that in, you get the pooled standard deviation of 0 0.00102. Okay, now what's the next step? If you remember this from class last week, we want to calculate the standard error, right, which is the pooled standard deviation over 1. The two, the this is this is our standard error, right? This is this is very analogous to s over square root of n, but it's just in this this form. So n of one is seven and eight. So our pooled standard deviation here comes out to 0. 0.000528. I'm sorry, I said pooled standard deviation. This is a standard error. Standard error for this situation. Okay. So then we can calculate our T statistic. Here I'm writing mu, but you know we could just as well write this as um, x bar 1 minus x bar 2. And of course that's the absolute value. So what is our 2? 2.31011 minus 2.29947 over our standard error equals 20.1 for our t statistic. Okay, so what does this tell you? Somewhat significant, very significant, not at all significant. Let's pull up our old friend the t table. So of course I'm going to post these slides. We're now on slide 18. So um, when you watch this you might want to just have, if you have two screens, look at the video on one or listen to the video and have the screens on the other. Um, if you can't read this, if we come all the way out here to p equals 0 0.0005, the t statistic here is 4.2. So we're way past that. We're way, 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 way significant. So p is much, much less than 0 0.0005. So very, very, very significant. And so that is how people learned that there was argon in the atmosphere. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. <laughs> right? So that was what led to the discovery of argon because argon is what, 1 or 2% in the atmosphere, but it weighs a lot more. And so he won the Nobel Prize in physics for discovering the densities of these gassing gases and discovering that argon was present in the air. Okay, wow. Okay, so of course you're not going to do this on a whiteboard or on a piece of paper. You're going to want to use Excel. So there's, it's relatively easy, but it's also easy to mess up. So let's talk about that for a little bit. So if you put these same numbers in Excel, um, so here's your source values for air and for the chemical reaction. 
Okay, so if you go up and in the equation bar type in t test, you can find t test. And what that does is returns the probability associated with a student's t test. Okay, so it's not going to output t, it's going to output p, right? It's going to output. these values via this table, okay? Okay, so the first thing you want to do is just select your cells. So array one is going to be this, array two is going to be this, Tails in this situation, so it'll tell you right here, oops, nope. Tails specifies the number of distribution tails to return. One tail distribution, put a one there, two tail distribution, put a two there. Okay, so for in this situation, um, I don't know that it makes a huge bit of difference. I, I guess technically the question is, is there a difference? Although, because this, is so much higher, you might want to say that maybe the, you know, the alternate hypothesis is the air, sample from air is heavier. This would be the alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis would be there is no difference between the air from, or the, 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 the nitrogen from air and the nitrogen from the reaction. Um, it's so significant that it's not going to make a difference if it's a one-tailed or two-tailed test. Um, but I think here I put in a two. And then this next one is called type. Okay, and this is, can be somewhat tricky. So here are the instructions. I know you couldn't read it. So if you put in a one, it makes it a paired t-test, and we'll talk about that next. If you put in a two, it's going to be two samples with equal variance, which is also called a homoscedastic situation. A three is two samples with unequal variance or heteroscedastic. Hetero, hetero and homoscedastic, those are great words, right? You can even, you'll either see it written as the heteroscedastity of the distribution. So what does that mean? It's talking about does the variance of the data stay the same? So here is a homoscedastic on the left and a heteroscedastic situation on the right. Okay, so if we look at how much does the variation change over the course of the data versus a homo, I'm scary, so this would be homo, it's constant, right? The air bars here are supposed to be written the same. Whereas here, it gets bigger over time, okay? How can you possibly know this? It's hard, right? It's really hard um, unless you have a lot of data to understand the distribution. Another way of thinking about this is that is your data, is your data normally distributed? Because if it's normally distribution, it's homoscedastic, right? If it's this would be almost like more like a Poisson distribution, right? Where you, where you have, um, where you don't have a normal distribution. So I almost always just assume that my data is homoscedastic, okay? So that means that I would put a two right here for type in Excel, okay? So then the final equation in Excel is t-test. Here's array one, array two, two comma two, and it outputs this p-value of 3.3 times 10 to the negative 11th, okay? So really, really, really significant, right? And that kind of corresponds to what we saw earlier where the t-statistic was 20 point something, which was, which was essentially off the charts, right? So this is, 
an example. This, this is how you would do this in Excel. So you should get really comfortable doing this as well. Okay, but it's easy to mess it up, especially in terms when you're picking your tails and you're picking the type. Now, when would it be, when would it be this, a paired t-test, right? I said on that last part there was one, two, and three. Two sample equal variants, two sample unequal variants, or a paired t-test. Okay, so this is a different situation, and in a paired t-test, you're measuring the exact same sample, right? What Rayleigh was doing is he was making two different samples. One from air that he purified, one where he's made synthetic nitrogen. Okay, these are not the same samples. Similarly, if you had a situation where you had synthesis method one and synthesis method two, right? This would be a situation, these are not a paired t test. But say you're in Darren's, Darren's Lepomi or Sheng Shu or Joe Wang's group or and you, you want to measure blood pressure or glucose or um, lactate or one of those things. And so you have your fancy sensor. And then you have the boring old sensor. And you have subject one, two, three, four, five, six. And you take sweat or saliva or whatever you're measuring and you measure with fancy and boring, fancy and boring, fancy and boring, fancy and boring. This is now a paired t-test, okay? So this is a different kind of test because you're measuring the exact same sample, okay? So again, what's the null hypothesis here? The null hypothesis is that there's no difference between x bar fancy, and X bar boring, right? And the alternative hypothesis would be that there is some difference. So in this example, it's really small too. This is the data that I'm using. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, so method A, method B, do, 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 do. Here's the difference between method A and method B. Okay, here it's bigger, A is bigger, A is smaller, A is bigger, 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 bigger. Okay, so if I, if you got this data, what would your null hypothesis be? Well, again, the null hypothesis, there is no difference. If I saw this, my alternative hypothesis would be method A gives me bigger, or I'm sorry, gives me, yes, gives me bigger values than method B. So the alternative hypothesis is method A is bigger than method B. Okay? So this would make it a one tail or two tail? One tail, yes. Okay. So how do we go about solving this then? Well, I calculated the X bar and the standard deviation of the differences. Okay, so for every situation, I calculated the difference and then I, then I calculated the mean and the standard deviation for the difference. And what you need to use here is okay, where d bar, actually let's just call this, I called this x bar but for this situation this is also d bar, and this is the standard deviation of the difference. Okay, so d is simply 
the summation of all differences divided by n and SD Right, same exact equation as the standard deviation, except it's for um, these differences. Okay, so our t statistic here then is can't even see. I'm in my own shadow. Zero point oh six divided by one point two times the square root of one two three four five six. Okay. So the T is 1.22, okay? So let's go to the table, 1.22, God, this is awful, I hate to erase it. So you've got this 1.22. So I said there's six. So we have five degrees of freedom. 1.22 would fall right here, right? So for a one-tailed test, we have a p-value that is less than 0.25 and greater than 0 0.1. So not very significant. Right? So we can't say in this situation that method one and method two are any different from each other. Okay? How would that look in Excel? What would you write for Excel? So here is T test again. So array one would be these cells. Array two would be these cells. And then here it's one because it's a one-tailed test. And type is one because it is a paired t-test, okay? <clears throat> and so the p-value it gives you here is 0 0.14, which is greater than 0.1 and less than 0.25, as we predicted from the table, okay? Good. Be really clear, this is a great way for me to write a really tricky exam question and um, you would need to know whether to do a paired t-test or a, a two-sample two sample equal variance test, okay? Okay, question? That's the example that I use, no. No, those are different situations. That's, that's the example. So my TA just asked me when we, did cell, when we do cell toxicity testing. So we do this all the time. And this was the example I showed in class uh, last week where we have increasing concentration of NPs and add more and more nanoparticles, right? So population with 100 micrograms per ml of nanoparticles is different than the population with 500 micrograms of nanoparticles. That's, that's definitely not a paired t-test, right? These are total, these are very, these are different samples. Yeah, yep. So the example would be like a paired t-test for this. Uh, I mean, would be if you were measuring if you were measuring like albumin in your cell culture media with an old method and a new method. You're not, there's no, there's not two methods in that. Okay. So the last thing then I want to talk about is this bland Altman analysis. And so it's a slightly more sophisticated way to look at and compare two different methods. So method, method A and method B. So in, a different, in addition to calculating the difference between them, you would also calculate the average, the average of method one and the average of method two, okay? And then you would plot that. So what this plots down here on the x-axis is the average of the two methods, on the y-axis is the difference, okay? 
You're then going to define your 95% confidence interval, so minus 1.96 standard deviations and plus 1.96 standard deviations. That's the standard deviation of the difference between the two methods. Okay? So for every, for example, if you, if you had the table, you would have all of these differences, and so you could calculate the average and the standard deviation similarly with the average of the two methods. So then you can draw your 95% confidence interval line here, plus 1.96 standard deviations, minus 1.96 standard deviations. And by definition, 95% of your samples are going to fall within that. So here's one that didn't fall, this one, this one, this one. But 95% of them fell within, although it doesn't look like 95%, but by definition, that should be 95% of your data should fall within these two lines. Okay, what else can you see? You can see that this is 0.162, so this corresponds to this value right here, and down here is 0.491, negative 0.491. Okay, so what you can do then is use this to look for bias. So is this skewed in one way or the other when you're comparing these two methods? It's consistently returning a more negative value, okay? And that is what this is giving you. This right here, this minus 0.164 is your bias. Okay, so this can start to tell you, are, is there a systematic difference between your, two, between your two methods and how much different are they, okay? To create one of these in Excel is not entirely straightforward, at least to get it to draw these 95% confidence interval lines and to clearly report the bias values, but there's a number of softwares out there, including GraphPad. Um, if your lab doesn't have it, you're welcome to ask me and you can use the version that we have. Um, but it's a really powerful way of looking for bias if you're comparing two different methods. And um, this is another good resource um, if you'd like to learn more about Bland-Altman analysis. Okay, so um, I hope this was helpful. I hope that you are a little bit more confident um, in using statistics to analyze your data and to be confident in your data. And I appreciate you um, being so lenient and letting me out of the classroom today. And um, I'm happy to take any questions on this um, when I return um, on Thursday, the 22nd, 23rd, whatever that day is. Okay, thanks again.